Welcome to Truth for Transformation. I am Timothy Brown, and I am delighted that you decided to study God's Word with us today. I want to encourage you to go and take your Bibles out. We are going to go through God's Word verse by verse today. And I also want to invite you to share this with your friends and family and like this page. We want to get God's Word out around the world, changing lives one life at a time. Let's prepare our hearts for God's Word. Father, we thank you that your Word is truth and that your Word has the power to change our lives. So Father, as we look into your Word, speak to our hearts and help this be a day where the truth changes our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Radiant Church. How is everybody? Good. Well, I'm Timothy. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're visiting, we just want to say welcome home. Take out your worship guides for just a moment. I want to call a few things to your attention. If you look inside the sermon notes, you'll see this card that says Care Team. And I just wanted to let you guys know that we're ramping up our pastoral care and ministries. As the church is growing numerically, we're trying to up the care. So if you'll turn on the back, it has a different person on call every day of the week. And what that means is that if you have a medical emergency or a crisis, even after office hours, you can call the church phone and you'll be prompted to, I think it's press number two, and it'll be directed to the person on call. And this person on call will have their phone by their bedside all night. So day or night, if you have an emergency, you can call directly to the church and there's a person on call. So put that on your fridge or somewhere where you won't lose that so that if there's some type of emergency in your family, your life, you can call and, and you can have a minister on call. Also, if you'll notice, there's these invite cards. Amy, if you'll hand me one of those invite cards. I left mine at the first service. So these invite cards, there's four different designs uh, of these. We, we've given you two. This one says we're saving a seat for you. This is the invitation you've been waiting for. So I want you to take these two and just use it to invite people to church. So for ladies, this will fit in your purse. For guys, you may want to put it in your uh, center console of your car. And just as you go out to restaurants, just, just have one of those on you. So that will be a great resource. We are doing a summer series with Paul's The Book of Revelation. And after the series, we'll resume this. Uh, typically during the summertime, we cover something that is really important to the church. And we're doing a series called Put Your Yes on the Table. So last week, as I mentioned, we talked about surrendering your entire life to Christ. And we had an amazing response. Uh, just a little preview of the next few weeks. Today we're talking about enjoying time with Jesus daily. What does that look like? Next week is we're going to talk about community, how we gather and worship in rows, but we connect in circles. Then we're going to talk about giving intentionally and cheerfully. Week five, we're going to talk about building up the church using your gifts. And then week six, this is one of my favorites, how to talk about Jesus, how to tell others about your faith in a way that is positive, in a way that will be a good presentation of the gospel. So let us prepare our hearts for the word as we pray and get ready for today's message. Father, we thank you for this time to gather. It's amazing to be a part of a church family. We don't take this lightly or for granted that we're not orphans, we're part of a family, the family of God. So Lord, as we look into your word and we talk about the importance of spending time with Jesus every day, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. We pray that you would open up our hearts to the word and that your word would transform our minds and our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited because this is one of my favorite topics. We're gonna talk about a book, a book that has transformed the lives of billions of people. 
We're gonna talk about a book that has withstood the test of time. Skeptics and critics have come and gone, but this book lives forever. Do you wanna hear more about this book? All right, this book is alive. This book is full of promises. This book gives courage to the faint of heart. This book inspires faith to those of you who are going through uncertain times. This book shows how to live forever after one dies. This book has great relationship advice. So if you're looking for a relationship, you're in a relationship, it's got really good advice. This book can strengthen your marriage. This book will give you great parenting advice. For those of you who have kids, grandkids, you're seeking advice, it's there. This book can help you become a better employee. This book can help you run your company in a way that honors God. This book can help you discover your purpose in life. What book am I talking about? The Bible. And it's like that little kid song, the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. You guys remember that song? Well, I wanna give you a little acronym that will help you understand what B-I-B-L-E stands for. Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. So today, as we talk about spending time with Jesus daily, obviously there's many ways to do this, but Bible study and prayer, we're gonna really emphasize the importance of getting into the word every single day. And this is something that's impacted my life and I'm sure it's impacted many of your lives. When I was the age of 14, teenager years, God really got a hold of me. And it started with surrendering my life to Christ as we talked about last week. And then after I surrendered, I heard a message about it's really important to get that daily bread. So I made a commitment at the age of 14 that for the rest of my life, I would read at least one verse of the Bible every day. And for, I mean, I'm 41 now, so you do the math, 26, 27 years, I've done it. Now there was one time I almost forgot, I was on vacation and we had traveled, I'm like, I was laying in bed, I'm like, you forgot to read the Bible. So what did I do? It's dark time, everyone's asleep. I started re remembering scripture and quoting it in my mind and so that way I could fulfill the promise of going through God's word. So I'm gonna ask you at the end of this message if you've never made that commitment, some of you have, some of you haven't, that from this day on, you would spend time with Jesus every single day. So let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter three. And as you turn there, we wanna welcome everyone here. Those digitally listening online and on the radio, we wanna welcome you to today's worship service. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God or the person of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. So today I wanna to give you three moving truths concerning spending time with Jesus daily. These are truths about the word of God that we can apply. The first truth is this, the Bible is the inspired word of God. Notice in verse 16, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So what does the Bible claim about itself? It makes two really big claims. The first claim is that every part of the Bible is God's word. Now when this was written by Paul to Timothy, we had the Old Testament, we had the New Testament being developed. But this includes all 66 books of the Bible as we have it. All of scripture is God's word. And the second claim is that God breathed out his word into the world by giving us his word. I'll say that again, God breathed out his word into the world by giving us his word. When, when the Apostle Paul used this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, some translations say God breathed. And that has kind of a double fold connotation. The idea is that God breathed out, all right? Someone exhale, I felt good, didn't I? Do that again. God breathed out his word. So that's saying that God is the source of inspiration. And then he breathed his word into the scriptures, which are the vehicle of interpretation. So what does that mean? That's saying that God is so gracious, he gave us his word. Now there are some people listening today 
that may be skeptical. I can't believe that any book written by a human could claim inspiration. There are many people who believe that. Or some people take a salad bar mentality. I pick and choose what I want. There are certain parts of the Bible I just throw away, other parts I like. How many of you have been through a salad bar? You, yeah, I don't like the broccoli, but yeah, I like this over here. The carrots are right. No broccoli. But can we do that with the Bible? I want to present to you today, the Bible is not a buffet that you can pick and choose what you want. You either have to embrace it all or not embrace it at all. It's not a, a salad bar. It's, it's the full word of God. So what I want to do today is encourage you with this. And this is to the skeptic, the person that struggles is believing in the Bible as God's word is not a giant leap into the dark. It's not a giant leap into the dark. It's a small step into the light. And I'll explain. We cannot prove anything to you today. Just like, can we prove the existence of God? Some of you are like, oh, I can. Can you put God in a test tube and say, this is God? It takes a step of faith, right? It takes a step of faith. Just like believing in the Bible we can't prove it to you, but we can present enough evidence to show you the case is leaning towards the evidence of the Bible being inspired. And I would propose to you also that if you're an atheist, an agnostic, a skeptic, it takes more faith to believe in evolution. It takes more faith to believe in yourself than it does in God and His Word. Amen? So we're going to talk about that today. It's a small step of faith into the light. So when he says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, what does that mean? Well, Peter gives us this in 1 Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. He says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about the prophet's own interpretation of things. In other words, they didn't just speak out of their head. Here's what happens. Prophecy never had its origin in the human will, not in the prophet's excuse me, but prophets though human, in other words, they were human, but listen, there was a higher inspiration. They spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I want to read that verse again. Just let that soak in. Prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets though human spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In the original audience, as they read this, this would remind them of vessels on the sea. People got on boats a lot back in the day and traveled a lot more on boats. Now we have planes, trains, automobiles. But what would happen is that boat would be driven by a gust of wind. That wind would drive that boat. So in the same way, prophets, men of God, were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Think about the gust or the wind of the Holy Spirit carrying them along. So that's kind of the idea. So it brings up the question, okay... That, that, that seems to be um, pretty obvious. The Bible is going to claim it's inspired. Do we have anything outside of the Bible, right? It's one thing for the Bible to say it's inspired, but how can you really know? What evidence do you really have? So what I want to do is present to you some evidence that will help add veracity to this claim. It will help add support to this claim. So at the end of this, you won't think it's a giant leap into the dark, but it's a small step of faith. It's still, a, it's still a step. So the first is archaeology. How many history buffs do we have that love studying archaeology, digging up things, finding things? So let's break down archaeology. How does archaeology provide support for the Bible? And you're listening, guy, there's a few things. First of all, his historical confirmation. Every time they've tried to dig up major areas that were cities, Many of these times when they've dug them up, they've discovered, wait a second, the Bible is right. I'll give you three examples. Skeptics question Jericho. Where is the biblical evidence of Jericho? You can do a Google search. Archaeologists have discovered Jericho. Silence the skeptics, all right? What about Babylon? What about Jerusalem? Archaeology has uncovered these ancient cities, and they have added cooperation, support to what the Bible says. You also have cultural and social practices. So the Bible talks about customs and traditions of people in that day, written in scriptures. When archaeologists have uncovered these cities and saw these artifacts and manuscripts and different things that talk about the culture, it supports what the Bible says. You have geographic and topographic accuracy. 
So any map people in here, I know Joe Perry's a map person. You ever wonder why you have the maps in the back of your Bible? How many of you have ever looked at the maps? And you're like, what's the big deal of the maps? Well, here's the big deal. When the Bible talks about geography, and then skeptics are like, well, we, we can't find that. I don't know where that's at on the map. And archaeologists have dug up these cities. It lines up with the maps. It lines up with even the topography of what the Bible says. And then for those of you who are researchers, you'll like this part, manuscript evidence. What's the importance of manuscript? Well, if you look at other ancient documents, there's not as many manuscripts as the Bible. I'm going to throw out a few things. I mean, if you heard of Aristotle, all of us, right? 49 manuscripts of Aristotle. Okay, that's not a lot. Um, Tacitus 31. And by the way, these numbers change because as archaeologists dig up, sometimes they find other manuscripts. Sometimes these manuscripts are hundreds of years removed from the original author, but they're still there. Plato, the most recent thing I found is 895. That sounds like a lot, right? Um, one more example is Homer's, Homer's Iliad. I mean, have you ever heard of Homer's Iliad? That's a famous work of art. Um, there are just shy of 1800, but I think the earliest manuscript they found with this is 400 years removed from Homer. So what about the Bible? Okay, you're, you're thinking of hundreds and some of these are only like 49 with Aristotle. They've, they've found about 25,000 manuscripts, 25,000. The earliest dates back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found this uh, fragment of the, 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 the Gospel of John that dates within like 50 years, 50 years, not hundreds of years. And as they've compared thousands and thousands of manuscripts, they line up. And though there are slight variations, no major doctrine is affected by the different manuscripts. So what does this tell us? It tells us that there's one author and he has kept his word pure. He has preserved his word. Because think about it, if God is true, would he ever want us to believe a lie? Because he's true, he's maintained the truthfulness of his word for all generations. So you can believe that the word is true. And one more evidence is cooperative inscriptions. What is this? Well, when they find tablets and seals and steels and other artifacts, and people will say, well, Pontius Pilate, he didn't exist. There's nothing in history. And all of a sudden, the archaeologist starts digging up. Here's this inscription to Pontius Pilate. He did exist. The Bible is true. So what I'm trying to say to you today is that the Bible is God's word, and there's a lot of evidence that backs that up, not just because it says, all right? For those of you who are not into history buffs, not into archaeology, let me give you prophecy, okay? It's been estimated when you add all the prophecies about Jesus alone, his birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, there are over 300 prophecies. That's a lot, right? And when you take 300 prophecies and somebody matches all of them. Now, keep in mind, a prophecy is spoken of sometimes hundreds of years before it happens and the event's correct. So let me give you what Josh McDowell said. This is so powerful. This is many years ago, Josh McDowell came up with this analogy. I want you to think about the great state of Texas. Any Texans out there? Say, yeehaw. All right, Texas, huge state. McDowell said, if you could get a silver dollar scatter them over the entire state of Texas two feet deep. So think about the state of Texas, silver dollars two feet deep, and we were to blindfold you, and you were to pick out one of those silver dollars that was painted red, the chances of you finding that one silver dollar in the whole state of Texas equals the chances of one person meeting these prophecies. Now, I want you to think about it. And in his stat, it was just Jesus meeting eight out of 60, okay? When you look at the stats, the probability of Jesus meeting just eight out of 60 prophecies, and this will blow your mind, but some of us aren't math majors, but just eight out of 60, I said there's over 300. If you just meet eight of them out of 60, the probability is one in 100 quadrillion. What is quadrillion? That's the number 100 comma 15 zeros. So how do we, what do we make of this? Because Jesus fulfilled all of these prophecies, 
The probability of him not being the Messiah is mathematically impossible. Translation, Jesus is the Messiah. It was prophesied and the Bible predicted it and it proves the veracity of Scripture. So it's a book we can trust. You can tell I'm getting a little fired up. All right, for those of you who, all right, history's good, prophecy's good, but what about the book itself? Is there anything within the Bible itself that supports that the Bible is inspired and God has maintained his word? The answer is yes. First of all, the composition of the Bible. What is the composition of the Bible? The composition is this, and you can follow along and you listen, God, there's a lot of notes. The Bible is not an individual book. It's a library of 66 books. It was written by 40 different authors and over a period of approximately 2,000 years. So think about that, 66 books, 40 authors, 2,000 years, written on three different continents, Africa, Asia, Europe. It was written in three languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And the Bible was written by people who were very different from each other. The authors include shepherds and kings and scholars, military general, cupbearer, a priest, a tax collector, a medical doctor, and a fisherman, just to name a few. And you're like, well, where does all this tie together? The Bible was written in a pre-digital era. What is a pre-digital era? Before internet, before email, okay? So think about it like this. Take, take the, the city of Asheville and take the most controversial topic you could think of. Think about gender roles or think about marriage and family, whatever, and you send it to 40 people in Asheville. How many different views do you think you'll get in Asheville? Probably 40 different views, right? So take the most controversial topics known to man, creation, how did the world come? Who is God? What is my purpose? What is marriage? What is family? Gender, sexuality, all these things, the most controversial topics even today, and span 2,000 years, pre-digital, they didn't have email back and forth, hey, you're going to write on this topic, make sure we say the same thing. And they all have unity together. What does that tell you? There is one author that has spoken his word and kept it throughout time. You can trust in the veracity of Scripture. How many of you remember JFK Jr.? Anybody remember him? What happened to him? He died in a plane crash. The year was 1999. And after they saw the site of the crash, they began to investigate what happened. And it was uncovered that JFK Jr. was a certified pilot, but he wasn't certified to use the instruments yet. The instruments on the plane help you to see where it's going when you can't really see what's happening outside. So according to the study, JFK Jr. flew at nighttime when he shouldn't have flown. Because at nighttime, you have to look at your instruments, and he wasn't certified to do it. So what happened is, because he relied on his own instinct, instead of the instruments, it crashed. And I think we can learn a valuable lesson from this story, that many of us are tempted to go by sight instead of by faith. God tells us something, and we're like, yeah, but here's what I see. Yeah, but here's who I know. Here's my experiences. Faith is not by sight, right? It's believing before you see it. So what I'm trying to present to you today is we have this Bible, this collection of 66 inspired books that if you follow them, if you go by faith and not merely by sight, it will keep you from crashing in life. It'll keep you from crashing in eternity. So I just want to encourage you that this is my Bible. I believe every single word of it. It is the Word of God. It is inspired. Every time I open it, God speaks to me. When you read the inspired book, you become inspired. God speaks to you. Every word is inspired. So you can trust in the truthfulness of the Word of God. You can trust that God will not lead you astray. You can trust in a world that's constantly changing. God's Word remains unchangeable. When people come and go, when skeptics come and go, we have a word that has stood the test of time and it will continue generations to come. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word, it will never pass away. It will stand fast forever. Amen. Amen. So what is the call to action before we go to our second point? 
I think the call to action is this. If you're not getting your daily bread, start today. Just one verse a day. Like, God, from this day forward, because this is your word, I don't want to go without it. I want the daily bread. I, I want to get in God's word daily. All right, truth number two, the Bible keeps you on the right path for your life. How many of you want to get addicted to drugs in this place? How many of you want to cheat on your spouse? How many of you want to die premature death because of poor decisions you've made? No hands are going up, right? And the reason why is we don't plan on it. It happens. It happens when we begin to make poor choice after poor choice. So Scripture says all Scripture is profitable. How is it profitable? Let me give you four areas. The first one is doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is a big Bible word that basically means teaching. It means knowing what God wants you to know. It's, it's knowing the Word of God and the will of God for my life. What is doctrine? It, it, it's, it's biblical teaching. So when you come to church, you're not coming to get entertained. You're not coming to hear a word from Timothy. You're coming to hear a word from God. And this is why we teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book through the whole Bible because we're not, we're not here to entertain you. We're here to give God's word. It's not about information. It's about revelation. It's about taking the word of God and saying, I believe it. I'm going to hear it. So that's why you're not going to get politics here. That's why you're not going to get popular opinion. That's not why you're not going to get political correctness here. You're going to get the word of God here. Because the word of God is the only thing that has the power to change a life. Not my opinion, not politics, not a candidate, not anything else, not a social justice movement, but the gospel and the word of God. So we will stand on it. So it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. How many of you like being told you're wrong? One person in the first service raised his hand. <laughs> Not many people that do it, right? So it's kind of like this. In ancient Israel, there was a famous king. You guys have heard of him, King David. And he thought he had it going on. He had a kingdom. He had a following. He had a lot of fans. And one day, he was out on his rooftop, and he saw a woman bathing. And her name was, help me out here, Bathsheba. Isn't that ironic? Bathsheba was taking a bath. I mean... Talk about play on words. So he sees her. He's like, she's gorgeous. Go get her for me. And he commits adultery with Bathsheba. And to cover up, because she got pregnant, to cover up so it doesn't feel like it's his kid, no one knows, he has her husband, Uriah, killed. So all of a sudden, David was struggling with his sin. He felt the guilt and the conviction, but he didn't know what to do about it. He's like, if I expose myself, what's going to happen? So God speaks to a prophet by the name of Nathan. And Nathan comes to David with his parable. There was a rich man who had a ton of sheep. Can you hear them? A ton of sheep. And there was a poor man that just had one little lamb. Ba, one little sheep. And the rich man was so power hungry, he took the one little sheep from the poor man. The rich man stole his sheep. Poor man had no sheep. What should we do to the rich man? And David's like, this guy doesn't deserve to live. He, he deserves the highest consequences of the law. And Nathan, in four words, reproofed David. He says, you are the man. And see, God didn't want to condemn David with these words. God wanted to build David back up. Yes, David had done the unthinkable. Murder, adultery, lies, I'm telling lies. But yet, the word of God reproofs you. The Word of God gets you back on track. So I just want to encourage you, the Bible is not just for information, it's not just for direction, but it's also for correction. So when you read the Bible, you'll see things in your life that are like, ooh, man, that doesn't feel good. So that brings us to the third thing, correction. What is correction? How many of you have ever broken a bone before? Raise your hand. All right. What did they have to do with the broken bone before they put the cast on? I had to set it straight, right? Align it. So here's the idea. We are all broken. The Bible says all of us, and that includes me, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is brokenness. So when we read the Bible, what it does, it helps align things back up. And as we continue to stay in God's Word, it serves like a cast around that broken bone. The Bible straightens us up, and through community, through fellowship, that cast, it brings healing. So guess what? You don't have to stay broken. 
You don't have to stay in your misery. You don't have to stay like King David did in his sin. God provides a way out. God doesn't speak to condemn us. He speaks to get us back on the right track. And that is the power of the word of God. I've heard old southern preachers used to say, the Bible will keep you from sin and sin will keep you from the Bible. In other words, if I read the Bible, it's going to help me avoid a lot of sin choices. But if I'm in sin, I really don't want to read the Bible. So we need to get in the Bible. We need to soak it in. The fourth thing it does is instruction in righteousness. Did you know that the Bible's so practical? It'll teach you how to be a better wife, how to be a better husband. It'll teach you how to be a better business owner, better employee. It'll teach you in the Proverbs how to have good financial management skills. It'll teach you how to have better friendships. Example, a person who has friends must be friendly. So if you want a friend, you got to be a friend. You know, little things like that. So I want to give you a method as we've talked about spending time with Jesus, starting in his word, and obviously prayer. There's multiple layers of spending time with Jesus. We focus primarily on one. I want to give you a really encouragement that as we get into God's word, as we look into his word, he begins to change us. As, as we look into it and we read it and we're saying it's profitable for instruction and righteousness that the man or the person of God may be equipped, Here, here's a tool that you guys can use this in your listening guide. It's called the sword study method. And you're like, what's a sword study method? If you look on the chart, there's a sword there. And there's different questions you can ask. Different sword methods have different one. But in your listening guide, I present four questions. The first one is, what can you learn about God? So when you read the Bible, it's primarily a book about God. What does it teach me about God? The second question, what can I learn about man or myself? What is the Bible trying to teach me about myself? Is there an example to follow? And is there a command to obey? If you use these four questions, what it's going to do, it's going to help set you in the right direction. It's going to be like, all right, God's teaching me this about himself. All right, God's teaching me this about myself. Is there something I need to change? Is there something I need to do? That will help you. Also on your listening guide, and for those who are listening online, we can send this to you. Just email us. Uh, there's a lot of resources. When many of you were growing up, there wasn't but a few resources, right? You had your Bible, and then how many of you remember the Schofield Study Bible or the Thompson Chain Reference Bible, right? It had all the references. How many of you remember that big Strong's Concordance? Anybody have a Strong's? Those were the tools we had, right? Now the tools are unlimited. So I just want to give you a few. I won't spend great detail, but Version Bible app. How many of you have the Version Bible app? If you don't have it, download it. It's on all smartphone devices. It's the Bible and all these different translations, and there's all these study tools, devo daily devotionals, really good. Right Now Media. How many of you have signed up for this at the church? Right Now Media. Church pays for it. It's free. It's the Netflix of Christian studies. I mean, there, there's like 14,000 videos. So there's a kid's channel, a student channel, husband's channel, wife channel, men's devotional studies, women devotional. Sign up. It's on the church website. If you'll go to our website, radiant828.com, click on media. You can sign up. If you don't have the link, email us. Um, Biblegateway.com is another good resource that has multiple uh, Bibles to read. We have a church podcast. Now, if you're looking for a good study Bible, and keep in mind, the Bible is the primary vehicle we're, we're reading, but sometimes you need some clarification. What is this talking about? I use the Thomas Nelson New King James Study Bible. It's got over 10,000 study notes. It's really good. It's a great resource. I would be sitting in seminary class. I'd hear the professor speak, and then I'd read that study Bible. And often, the study Bible would have better insights than the professor. No, 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 no criticism to professors, but I, I, I've really enjoyed that. So that's a good good resource. If you're a new believer, maybe you've not been in church in 10, 20 years, maybe you're new to the faith, a good translation can help you understand it. So NIV or New Living Tr Translation has a, a life application study Bible, really good for new believers or people just getting back to church. There are a lot of good Bible teachers on YouTube. There's a lot of bad ones too, but there's some good ones out there. I'm going to give you three. Uh, Skip Isaac, you guys know he's a personal mentor, encourager to me, really good Bible teacher. David Guzik's another one. He has a commentary online you can read for free. And the other one many aren't familiar with, but Gary Hamrick, he's in Washington, D.C. area, really good Bible teacher. These are all people that just go through the Bible verse by verse. So truth number three is, as we land this plane, is the Bible encourages 
equips and empowers you for God's work. So notice verse 17, our final verse today. It says that the man or the person of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So here's the idea behind that. God likes to send you his word so that you can be equipped for his work. He gives you his word so you can be equipped for his work. How many of you believe that God has a calling for your life? Raise your hand. Okay, if you want to be encouraged, equipped, and empowered, you have to get into the Word. No matter what the calling is, it's not just for pastors and evangelists. The Bible equips you for what God has called you to do. So some of you are retired right now. What has God called you to retirement? You'll find it in the Word. He, he's going to lead you through the Holy Spirit. Some of you are raising children right now. How does God want you to know how to raise your kids and have your priorities in order? It's the Word of God. So God sends his word into the world so that you can be equipped for the work that God has given you to do. And he has a purpose and a plan for all of you. So let's summarize this into one sentence. We're talking about put your yes on the table. What is the big yes for today? The big yes for today is this. I will commit to daily devouring the Bible. Notice daily devouring. It's not a simple reading. It's like I am eating up the word. I am getting into the Word, and the Word is getting into me. And I'm going to spend intentional time with Jesus every single day in the Word and in prayer. Because every time I open that book, that book speaks to me. Every time I read the Bible, it reads me. It's like a mirror. I see myself. I see where I'm at. So three action steps. How do we apply this? I've already mentioned this over and over again, but the first one is start spending time with Jesus daily starting today. So if you've never committed to a daily reading of the Word, tell him what, you're missing out on daily bread. Just even five minutes, even one verse. You're like, well, I don't know where to start. One simple thing is the proverb of the day. Today is the 16th. Read Proverbs chapter 16. I don't know where to start. The Gospel of John's a good place to start. Some of you started in the book of Leviticus and you're like, I don't understand. Start in the Gospel of John. Start simple. Leviticus comes later, okay? Number two, utilize resources for Bible study. The Bible is the primary book. That's the book. Even if you don't have any resources, it's okay. But if you don't understand what you're reading or you want to go deeper, I've given you a long list of resources that you can utilize. And if you want more, email us. We'll send you more. And number three, apply God's Word to your daily life. The Bible was not written primarily for information, but it was written for transformation. That the person of God may be equipped for every good work. So today I want to leave you with this. The Bible is God's word. You can trust it. You can believe it. And if you really do believe it, what's keeping you from daily digesting it? What's keeping you from getting into it, memorizing it? God, help us to put this into practice. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I'm convicted myself. I need to memorize your word more. That's, that's my action. I don't know what anyone else is. I got to memorize it more than I have. So forgive me for that. Forgive me for my negligence in memorizing the word. As we pray, I want to talk to believers first. Some of you may be like, I'm not reading the Bible every day. It's no legalism. It's not works-based salvation, but it's like God, your father's wanting to speak to you every single day. And if you've neglected that time with God, just tell him, here he knows. Just say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me for not spending time with you as I should. And the gospel gives us the power to want to be with God. The gospel gives us the power to desire God. So maybe it's praying for the desire. God, strengthen my appetite for the word. Help me to long for it more. Help me to crave it like I would my daily bread. As the believers continue to pray, just do business with God. There may be one here today that your yes is not just spending time with God daily, but it's coming to God for salvation. The Bible tells us that Jesus died for our sins. God doesn't want to condemn us. He wants to redeem us. So if you've never invited Jesus to save you, the first step is acknowledging that you're a sinner. Like you can't ask for forgiveness if you don't realize you have sin. So the first step is to acknowledge that I'm a sinner and is to realize that Jesus is the Savior. He fulfilled all the prophecies. He is the Messiah. He is God in the flesh. So if you've never invited Jesus to save you, we give this opportunity every Sunday to those listening, to those listening online. I want you to reach out and say this prayer. Say, Jesus, 
First of all, I acknowledge that you're the Savior and I need saving. I realize that I'm a sinner. I realize that I've made mistakes. I've done things that are unholy. I've done things that have let others down. Please forgive me. I believe you died and rose again, Jesus. And I want to receive what you did for me on the cross. And Jesus, I make the decision to follow you. Not just to get out of help free prayer, but I make the decision to follow you for the rest of my life. With no one looking around, did anyone pray that prayer? To slip up your hand. It's going to take a moment. If you pray that, to slip your hand up. Anyone at all? See that hand. Amen. Anyone else? Did you pray that prayer? The Bible says if you prayed that prayer, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Father, thank you that we have the Word of God. Thank you that we've had a spiritual meal already in the Word of God. And I pray that we would leave this place full and hungry. Full because we've just had a spiritual meal, but hungry for more of your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today for Truth for Transformation. My prayer is that God's Word resonates deep within your soul. My mission here at this ministry is to encourage and equip and empower you to reach your full God-given redemptive potential. If you would like to partner with this ministry, you can do so by going to our church website. That is radiant828.com. Our mission here is to get the good news of Jesus Christ all around the world in its various formats. We want to do this through preaching. We want to do this through writing books that are going to encourage people. And we want to do this through radio and television. So your partnership helps us to reach more lives. We hope that this was a blessing and we hope to see you next week.